Um, some years ago, I wrote a kind of memoir of my first 21 years, um, from the time of my birth until I arrived in Canada at the age of 21. And, and having published that memoir, everyone, everyone, 100,000 people, said to me, now, what about part two? How, what, what, what happens next after you were 21? And I said, I don't want to do it because it's not interesting. Uh, it's not interesting. I had all kind of, I uh, was at the university and then I became a CBC producer and it's not interesting. It's not interesting, I said. But then I thought it over and I decided I was quite right. It was not very interesting. But what was interesting is all the things that went on around me and especially the things I had to deal with as a CBC producer. And then I decided, oh, well, maybe I'll try it. And in my so-called memoir, which was called um, I Remember the Location Exactly, I nearly forgot. I Remember the Location Exactly. I told my story, such as it was, in the form of little stories. Uh, little vignettes, little stories, which were put together and then made a book. And the stories were substantially true, what I remembered. But I found it easiest and most interesting to tell the events of my first 21 years in the form of stories with the beginning and the middle and an end. And some of it was amusing and some of it was not so amusing. And then I decided to yield to the demand of the 100,000 people who wanted me to go on, uh, to tell the rest in a similar style, in the form of stories. And that is what I have done. And now a book has come out of five stories that deal with five people who played a role in Canada around the year 1960, around the year, the beginning of the 60s, because that was a very interesting period, and we think about it a lot, and these five people have played a certain role in Canada and in my in quotation marks, professional life, as a, I had to deal with them. And I did, I had to, I didn't have to, but I wanted to. And these five men, all interesting for different reasons, were Glenn Gould, Marshall McLuhan, Lester Pearson, René Levesque, and John Diefenbaker, and these are my five heroes. And I, I, I didn't really know any of them well. I didn't have. Uh, Glenn Gould I met once uh, because I produced a film in which an interview with him, I didn't conduct it, uh, was a centerpiece. And uh, I met him, and uh, of course we didn't shake hands because he didn't shake hands with anybody. Uh, but I have had, I have and had friends who knew him very well, and uh, and and uh, I felt that through them I knew him, and I mean enough for me to go to his funeral, which was a very major event and very moving. And Marshall McLuhan, I met quite often. I met him. I. Uh, I think I once interviewed him, and I met him at parties because he was very sociable, but I think he always confused me with somebody else. And Lester Pearson I never met, really. Uh, and the story I told about him revolves around a Kuchiching conference in 1958. Kuchiching, that is an annual public affairs conference in which the CBC was involved, 
and I went to almost all summer conferences, with the exception of those in the 70s, for the last 60 years or something like that. And I'm still involved, although less than I used to be. And in that conference in 1958, a lot of world historical events were discussed, but I linked it with something else. I linked it with a book a friend of mine wrote called Stephen Vicency, Hungarian, which was called In Praise of Older Women. And many of you may remember that book because it had a brilliant title, In Praise of Older Women. And what I, in that book, which he published himself, there was a chapter towards the end of the book, which is very, very amusing, I think, uh, in which he visited that conference. He attended that conference in 1958. But he didn't write about that conference specifically. He wrote about the experience. He had just arrived from Hungary after the revolution and was in Saskatchewan at the university teaching European affairs. His English was atrocious. In fact, he spoke Hungarian in every language. He spoke Hungarian when he spoke English. And I don't know how his students could follow him. And it was, and, he, and he's, still, he's still a friend of mine. He's, his English is not much improved. Though he is a terrific writer, and writes beautifully English, but his spoken English is, well, let us say, uh, Hungarian. And I linked the, his adventures with older women at this conference. I linked it to the conference in which Lester Pearson was the keynote speaker. I actually, I must confess, I wasn't at that conference, but I got the p p p p precise executive summary of the conference from the management and whatever I wrote is accurate. Now who else is there? René Lévesque. Now René Lévesque I did know and I did know him at the very beginning of his career in the very early 50s because he was a producer as I was in the international service of the CBC broadcasting on shortwave to Europe after the war. And he was a young journalist, and he was not a bit interested in Canadian affairs at the time. He was above all interested in American affairs. He went to, he, the CBC sent him to uh, one or two conventions in the States, and he was fascinated by American politics. And he and I were among those who covered the royal tour of the Princess Elizabeth and her new husband, Prince Philip, uh, across the country. The CBC was very good at covering royal tours. They were very loyal to the royal family. Anyhow, there we were, after the tour was over, saying goodbye to their royal highnesses, the prince and the princess, in Portugal Cove in Newfoundland where the royal yacht had been anchored. And they left after the royal tour. And there was René and I saying goodbye to them. And René was waving a Union Jack. And somebody took a picture of him and me waving a Union Jack because we were very loyal to the crown. And uh, But I have lost that picture and I don't think it exists anymore. But if I did, it would be a greatly very historical event because... René Lévesque then became the leader of the Separatist Party and became Premier of the province in 1976 and has been a very major figure in Canadian politics. And, in fact, the CBC building from which we broadcast at the time was on Dorchester Street, which is now called Boulevard René Lévesque. So he became a very big man. And then there was John Diefenbaker, whom I once met, I think, as he came out of an elevator of, uh, uh, in a CBC studio in Toronto, and uh, we shook hands. And that was the extent of my knowing him. However, I was among those CBC producers who uh, 
in protest against what we knew had happened, namely gross interference with the CBC, uh, resigned in protest uh, because a show in which uh, public affairs show, which called which was called uh, preview commentary, had been taken off the air, had been taken off the air without satisfactory explanation. And we, who were working for the Public Affairs Department, which was very central, the central activity comparable to the news, uh, were convinced that there had been interference by John Biefweger, uh, uh in the internal affairs of the CBC into the and the, and that is an absolute no no to for the government for any government to interfere with the autonomy independence of the CBC a gross crime a serious capital offence and Stephen Baker himself while he was in the opposition had always been very upset when there was the slightest suspicion that a liberal government had interfered with the CBC, and he, he shouted, bloody murder, if this happened. And we were sure it had happened. And our bosses went to Ottawa to under to, to ask, uh, how come this program was taken off the air, which is an interference, which is something which we would, we would resent, even if our bosses did it without an explanation. And we got no answer, and our bosses got no satisfactory answer, so we all resigned. And it was a major affair. And this is the subject of my story uh, uh, about John Diefenbaker, who had, he had just become, uh, had won a, 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 a second election with a huge majority, I think the largest majority ever in Canadian history. And that is the subject of my story of John, 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 John Diefenbaker. Now, any reader who reads my five stories would ask, would be entitled to ask, well, these are lovely stories, and they're funny, and, 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 and some of them not so funny, but they are meant to be very vivid. What is true about them? There are all kinds of characters in them, some of them may be invented. And what is true about them? What is true and anybody who writes historical fiction, as I have done for some years now, is inevitably asked, invariably asked, you made that up, didn't you? It's what is true. How am I, how am I supposed to know what is true, what's not true? And, and my answer to that is always the same. I always say everything I write is true, the essential truth. I'm trying to convey the essential truth as I did in the case of John René Lévesque, it is the moment in which he became a separatist, like a snapshot. It was essential. But all the characters around this event, or many of them, I invented. And I gave them fictitious names. But the important thing is that the essence is true. The essence is true. And I claim, I think I'm right, I will defend it, that fiction, so-called fiction, is very, very, very well suited to telling the truth, although it doesn't seem like it. People are conditioned to think the truth is only in prosaic history books, some of them very learned. But I say that in order to tell the truth, sometimes fiction is better than kind of the normal history books which we have to learn history at school or whatever. And uh, uh, so I think and I hope that my little book, which only got 86 pages, will be useful to people who don't know very much about Canadian history, recent history, the history in the golden years around 1960, which some of us remember as a good period in Canadian history, and that they will get the truth from my fiction.